The only thing that's certain, I think, as we look forward in U.S. health care is that it's going to look really, really different in 10 years than it does today. Uh, the only thing that everyone agrees on, as we've seen in Congress, is that the current system is broken. Uh, we pay nearly one-fifth of our GDP for health care without getting better results. Um, even in those high-tech areas where logic says our high-priced system should reign supreme. I mean, one of the most depressing things to me, uh, the most depressing studies I've read recently, is that people with cystic fibrosis, a chronic childhood disease, uh, actually live 10 years longer in Canada than in the U.S., even though their treatment depends on intensive technology and expensive drugs. That's an area where if our system was working and all the narrative about uh, the, the wonders of U.S. medicine were true, we would expect better results here. Um, perhaps more important than that for me, where I sit as a, someone who used to be a physician and now as a journalist, patients are feeling angry, abandoned by a government and a system that feels like it doesn't care. I mean, we look at the town halls this year, earlier this year, uh, people were getting up and haranguing their representatives, and what, they, what were they talking about? It was health care. And that's something we didn't really see during the campaign, other than the, the kind of constant refrain of repeal and replace. Now people are angry. Um, they're upset about haywire premiums and drug prices and out-of-pocket costs and deductibles that are not keeping up or that, that are outpacing their salaries. Um, many people I speak to and I hear from everyone who's having trouble with health care in our country as a journalist, um, a lot of them are spending more on health than on housing or food, and I don't think that's where we want to be. And they're fed up with a system that, spends a, that, that uh, charges a lot but doesn't give them much in the way of care or what they see as caring. So that's part of why the discussion here at Transform and your participation is so important to me. Um, we can help decide right now, today, after that bill failed yesterday, maybe what the future will bring. Um, and that needs to include what we're calling here closing the gap between people and health. So I'm thrilled to be hosting this conference because this, to me, is the key issue. And I'm going to explain a little bit about my background so you know why I care so much about this. Um, I'm the kid of a doctor. My dad was a pediatric hematologist, uh, treated a lot of kids with hemophilia at a time when there wasn't much treatment. I trained as an MD in a slightly more idealistic and less money-driven time. I trained in internal medicine, and in medical school and during my residency, we repeated this mantra over and over again. The question was always, to whom is duty owed? And the answer was always the patient, and that seems kind of obvious. Um, not the hospital who employs you, not the press gainy score, uh, not the insurer. I think we've created a system where that credo, that mantra, is a little bit hard to follow. And as a journalist, I've been hearing from patients loud and clear for the last few years about their dissatisfaction. Um, I'm going to provide you with a little empirical data. Uh, it's not entirely a, a controlled study, but it'll give you a sense of where I'm coming from. When I was at the New York Times, I spent two years writing a series called Pain Till It Hurts. This was during what are essentially the prehistoric days of, of social media, 2013. But we, I mean, you know, four years ago. But we decided as a novelty to ask readers to share their stories about their healthcare experiences. Um, the newspaper was overwhelmed. We got more than 10,000 stories. Um, it, was, it remains the most commented on series in the New York Times, uh, more than Nate Silver on Election Day, I like to point out, um, which makes me very proud. But the stories that I heard from people were really alarming. Um, some of them you may recall if you read the series. There was Michael Chopin, who had to go to Belgium for a hip replacement because his hip injury was considered a pre-existing condition and not covered. Uh, he discovered that the out-of-pocket cost for that in Seattle would have been over $100,000. So he decided to go to Belgium for the, the implant, um, which cost him $13,000, including round-trip airfare for two. So there you go. Uh, there was Kathleen Hayden, who showed me her pump. She has type 1 diabetes, and even though she has a good job, she has a hard time managing the cost. She showed me her pump and said, it looks like a beeper, but it's the most expensive thing I own aside from my house. 
There was Len Charlap, who was a mathematician in Princeton. He had one echocardiogram at a community hospital in Princeton that was billed at $5,000, and then had the exact same test at Harvard for $1,000. And he's a numbers guy, and he wanted to know why, so he called me. So those are all the cost issues, and those, that price variation, 1,000 versus 5,000, probably isn't a surprise to anyone in this room. What was surprising to me is to learn that in Japan, that same echocardiogram would have cost under $150. Um, anyway, so those were cost issues, but there were also other stories, ones that were in many ways more wrenching. Because these are New York Times readers, they mostly could afford the bills even if it bothered them, but they were really upset about a health system that seemed to no longer care for them, no longer delivered or responded to their needs. They'd been prescribed lots of medicines, they'd had endless tests and procedures, but it didn't really address their conditions and their their humanness, which they really missed. So finish that series, and if you're a project reporter, you move on to another topic, and I was supposed to move on to infrastructure, which um, I was less passionate about than healthcare. So I decided to leave, take my 10,000 stories and write a book, which came out this spring, uh, called An American Sickness, How Healthcare Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back. And this is what I heard from patients and why I felt I needed to write that book. They were grateful to be healed, but frustrated by a system that seemed to have lost its humanity and common sense, that treated them more or less like a widget moving through a profit-making machine. And I'm talking about people and, uh, who are in the book, someone like Barbara Baxter, who got a defective hip implant, and only to discover by Googling that the piece of metal and ceramic within her body had been recalled for, because it was leaking toxic metals into her blood and into the surrounding tissue. She's now paying out of pocket herself for her ongoing monitoring. Um, or there was another woman, I, I love the patients who contacted me because their stories were kind of unbelievable, but I asked for the bills, I asked for the documents. I'm a good journalist that way. Kathleen Williams of Ohio, who uh, was in a little minor bike crash, she accepted the fire department ambulances offer to take her to the hospital, only to discover that where she lives, which is Cincinnati, or right outside of Cincinnati, the fire department puts out fires for free, but billed her $1,000 for the three-mile ride to the hospital and didn't participate in any insurance that's available in that part of Ohio. There was Robert Jordan, who had a minor outpatient procedure and was billed $2,000 each by a nurse anesthetist who gave him propofol and by a doctor, an anesthesiologist as well, who he remembers came in right before this minor procedure, did what he called a drive-by and said, any questions? Mr. Jordan said no and got a bill for $2,000. Um, again, why aren't people trusting our system, feeling like it meets their needs? Um, there was Barbara Benion, whose cataract surgeon tried to convince her to pay $3,000 extra per eye to have laser surgery, even though studies have shown no benefit. Now, she's lucky her son-in-law is an ophthalmologist and said, don't do it. Um, and finally, um, my, one of my favorites was Mike Webman, Mike, Michael Wegman, an auditor in Texas, who has prescribed a drug called Duexis. I don't know if any of you have heard of this drug. Um, it is nothing more than a, a combination of two cheap prescription drugs, brand named Advil and Pepsid, yet combined it's covered by five patents and billed $1,600 a month, even though each of those drugs individually costs a dime a day, maybe. Um, so he called me, he was wondering, like, why would any doctor prescribe this drug? Why would a company make it and get patent protection? Um, the answer is because it works. So there were pa patients who couldn't find in-network physicians, though dozens were listed in their directories, patients whose doctors had gone concierge or started charging monthly fees if you wanted your doctor to answer your phone calls, uh, patients whose doctors were more focused on the computer than on their well-being, the patients felt. Um, the litany seemed never ending, and uh, if you want to kind of get a sense of all the ways the system can fail patients, those 10,000 comments are a great way to start. Um, in fact, after a year of, of spending time with these stories while writing my book, um, I, I felt I demoralized, 
wiser about the forces that govern our care and maybe even a bit paranoid so that when I, I'm a jogger and when I wiped out on the sidewalk near Columbia University where I lived at the time, I hit my head really hard on the curb. I had a bleeding forehead, a swelling eye. I was dazed. My eye was getting shut. And uh, a whole bunch of people ran over to me and said, do you want us to call an ambulance? And suddenly I cleared my head, jumped up, and said, no. And uh, you know, two, two kind Columbia students thinking, who is this crazy woman, walked me to the hospital. So there we go. Um, the US system, I think, is poised for great transformation. I, I hope we can, once again, put patients first. As a journalist, I've written again and again about how our innovation is to get to patient-centered, evidence-based care. I'd repeated that hundreds of times as a journalist. And then when I was writing the book, I thought, wow, what other kind of health care could there be? Isn't that the very definition of medicine, patient-centered, evidence-based? Um, but another reason I think we're at a real tipping point now is that many of the doctors, many of the people in the system, the nurses, the, the, the techs, are frustrated and ready to partner in change as well. Um, that caring and emotional connection that gave so much meaning to the profession when I was training, that gave so much meaning to the profession for me, um, I think has been lost for a lot of people amidst the, the wrangling with insurers, the hospital policies, the, the administrative task, the fragmentation. So I heard from a lot of doctors as well, a lot of stories that some of them are in the book. And I think in particular of a, someone named Dr. Frank McCuller, who recently retired as a pediatrician in Oregon, who spent hours telling me about how the Catholic hospital where he practiced for his entire life had turned from a caring place that treated everyone in their ER, to a kind of corporate mammoth with billing classes, which he called charm school, marble lobbies, um, an obsession with patient satisfaction scores, and a hotel-like atmosphere that treated rich people very differently than the poor. Uh, he really came to despise that. Um, I think also of someone named Greg Duncan out in California, who uh, went after the hospital where he practices because he felt they were charging his patients facility fees that were unreasonable, and some of his patients couldn't afford to get the surgery that they needed. So I, it seems to me right now that medicine has strayed far from its sense of mission, which is about people. And it seems like also the time is ripe to take it back. Patients want it. Providers want it. Um, we need to close that gap. We want better value in healthcare. That's kind of another mantra. But first, we have to define for all of us what's valuable about medicine. And that's partly what I hope we'll do over the next few days. And I'd venture to say it's not just the MRI or the newest genetic tests. It's that human dimension. Um, that's why I jumped at the opportunity to host Transform, to think fast forward and out of the box about what we all, now that the GOP efforts at least temporarily are um, abandoned. What we want Amer American health care to look like for the future, what kind of system do we all want to practice in that we'll feel good about that closes that gap 